Hello and welcome back to our course. Lecture 4 is about behavioral economics, um, a part of it, a branch of it, if you will, called behavioral finance. If you watch the nightly news when they talk about the financial markets, what you see are pictures of people engaged in a wild activity, either shouting bids and asks on the trading floor or talking on three phones simultaneously in a trading room away from the floor. In contrast, if you read any standard finance book, you might get the impression that no one is home, that people are nearly absent from the financial markets. You will find great attention to computing important numbers such as present values and rate of return, and even how to price options, but virtually no people. This leads us to a question. Since we know that humans are involved in the financial markets, how are the markets influenced by their presence? Would the financial world be materially different if investors, traders, managers, and workers were all replaced by computer programs and algorithms? We say yes, and we will prove it in this lecture. <clears throat> we need to be concerned with how real investors behave, and that is behavioral finance. According to Richard Taylor, behavioral finance is simply open-minded finance, where we entertain the possibility that some of the agents in the economy behave less than fully rational some of the time. It is essential to understand how investors behave if we are to truly understand how prices behave. And to illustrate the role of emotions in certain financial markets, uh, recently, decision researchers have come around to the view that emotions may be more than mere distractions in the decision process, but are integral and necessary part of the decision making. In June 2003, an article in the journal Finance investigated the relationship between weather and stock market returns. The authors collected daily market performance data from the financial markets in 26 countries over a period of 15 years. They found that there is a significant correlation between sunny mornings in the cities where the exchanges are located and positive daily returns. The explanation offered for these findings is that sunny day make traders happy and happiness leads to optimism and optimistic traders push up the stock prices. These findings are difficult to reconcile with rational price setting. Okay, so this was the introduction. I divided this lecture in four themes, uh, limits to arbitrage, equity premium, investor behavior, and common mistakes investors make. So let's get started with the first topic, limits to arbitrage. In the traditional finance there's a traditional finance paradigm that understanding financial markets uh, it leads us to understand financial markets by using models in which agents are rational. And we define rationality in this situation by when agents receive new information about the markets, they update their beliefs accordingly and correctly by adjusting the probability of event, event occurrence. Basically, they're using Bayes' theory and the moment they got a new event, a new update, updated information from the market, they also correct the probability of the event that will happen. And the second um, part is that once they receive these beliefs, once they change their beliefs, they are making choices that are normatively acceptable, meaning that they are behaving in some sort of rational way. So this is a, the way things are, have been set in the financial markets. Some of the reason is that data is easily available. Obviously, we have plenty of data over the 75 years of financial markets available at our fingertips, daily stock prices, uh, and even uh, more frequent than that. And then it's easier to get the data and to run a lot of models and algorithm, algorithms with, with the data but we don't have that much information about the people that are participating in the market. So that will be one explanation. But the, this traditional framework that we have, it's simple and we would love for it to work. However, its predictions are not confirmed by data. It does not 
produce understanding about how the stock market functions um, over time and even in detail and doesn't provide any kind of information over the individual trading behavior. So that is where behavioral finance, like behavioral economics, which is a branch of behavioral finance, trying to fill in the gaps and to see how investor behavior influences the financial markets. So we will argue that some financial, some financial issues will be better understood if we add this um, um, assumption that agents, some agents are not fully rational. So we will try to update the assumption that agents fail to update their beliefs correctly and they're not necessarily making the choices that are normatively correct. All right, so the limits to arbitrage topic. Market efficiency, this is the, the piece where we were um, told and we were we learned in, in class that market are, markets are efficient. What does it mean? It's based on some framework, um, traditional framework that agents are rational, that there are no frictions in the market, there are no costs that are, are going to uh, add friction to the market, and there is um, a fundamental value that for each security price, which is a discounted sum of the expected cash flow from the future. So the financial market, the financial economic theory came up with the efficient market hypothesis, which it states that at any moment with the information available in the market is reflected in price. So the prices are always right. And therefore, there's no way to take advantage of mispricing, which is arbitrage, where there are no, so there's no investment strategy that can earn in excess of risk adjustment average returns. So because all the information is already priced in, there's no way to create arbitrage. So behavioral finance argues that some asset prices deviate from fundamental values. And these deviations are brought in by agents who are not fully rational. In short, biases that affect everybody, um, all humans, are also present in the humans that work in the financial market. And this is kind of the assumption that we're, we're trying to prove. The um, efficient market hypothesis argues that any change up and down in the asset prices caused by irrational, irrational traders will be quickly undone by rational agents. For example, if for some reason we bid up a price for an security and it is going to an irrational level, there will be people who would short the security, bringing the, the prices down to the fundamental value. So the fundamental value for the share of Ford is $20. A group of irrational traders that become excessively pessimistic, so you notice this emotion part here, becomes excessively pessimistic about Ford's future prospect and sell the stock down until it reaches $15. So this is the, the, the presumption that um, based on some information on the market, the, this irrational trader developed a pessimistic view of the Ford's future, so therefore they sold, so they're not caught with losses, they sold until the price went to $15. The efficient market hypothesis proponent argue that in this case, rational traders, sensing there's an arbitrage here, they will start buying the Ford shares, that's $15, and uh, at the same time buying something similar, uh, shorting a, a substitute security like GM, that is similar that is similar in value to Ford, and therefore the buying pressure on Ford shares will eventually bring 
back the price to the fundamental value of $20. So this is the idea. If the markets are efficient, where there's no markets, this arbitrage opportunity does not exist. So we cannot short things that are not necessarily priced, like uh, your college experience or your marriage uh, situation. You cannot short those. So there's no markets for those. This only applies where the markets are traditional, uh, competitive, free markets, if you will. There are no necessarily, there are no costs. There's no, not much friction. So behavioral finance takes issue with the first assumption and not the second. In fact, so the second assumption is that when we have an opportunity for arbitrage, it should be quickly exploited and, and that happens. The first assumption is where the, the, the issue is and the first assumption says even when their asset price is mispriced, strategies to correct the mispricing are risky and costly, which makes the arbitrage unattractive and the mispricing can remain unchallenged. So in other words, uh, there, there are some friction in the market. We have to relax that assumption. And because this arbitrage is costly, costly and risky, uh, it doesn't look like it's an attractive action and people don't just jump in to do the arbitrage right away. An arbitrage is an investment strategy that, that offers riskless profits at no cost it's something that behavioral finance contradicts. If the prices are right, that means there's no free lunch. You cannot get excess uh, returns um, in the market if the prices are always correct. But when there's no free lunch, that doesn't mean the prices are right. right? So then it doesn't mean there's an arbitrage there. So let's see what risk we have when we're trying to bring back the, the for the security stock at, and buy it at 15, there's a fundamental risk. Buying it at 15, there's no way guaranteeing the return to the fundamental value of 20. So that's why traders hedge by shorting a similar security. However, um, if Ford has a fundamental risk, that means something happened in the industry, it most likely that General Motors also have that kind of risk. So there's a correlation between securities that uh, has to be taken in consideration and that leaves traders vulnerable to Ford falling even further, leading to losses, obviously in the short run. So that buying, buying Ford security at $15, there's no guarantee that it's gonna go back up at $20. This is what we call noise trader risk, the risk that mispricing can worsen in the short run. If you allow that the prices, the possibility that the prices can move away from the fundamental value, that, that it could move up or down, not necessarily only up. So we should allow for the possibility they can go even further, at least for the short run. And obviously there is transaction cost, implementation cost, commission, bid as spread and price impact all make this mispricing less attractive. Um, plus the cost of finding and learning about the mispricing. So there are the, the limits to the arbitrage that we see in the market, which kind of makes this um, challenging for, behave, for uh, traditional economics to, to explain. So let's see what drives this behavior in the market. And we talk about the psychology of irrational traders. Uh, the theory of limited arbitrage, which we just showed. It shows that even irrational traders can cause a mispricing in the asset prices, in the security prices. Rational traders will often don't have the tools and risk appetite to do anything about it, right? There are a few things that happen in the, the few biases that are at, place, at play here. Beliefs that shape expectation. Overconfidence is one of them. Um, overconfidence is present as we saw before. Overconfidence is present in every one of us. Um, doesn't exclude traders, obviously. And uh, some of the pieces of the overconfidence, one of the three pieces is over precision when we are actually assigning 
far too narrow confidence intervals to our decision outcome. We really believe that we're very precise um, and when we are not. Anchoring is another uh, big bias that we discussed, which, which is we anchor, we are being influenced by an anchor, but we always under adjust when we try to estimate probabilities. So events that we think that are certain to occur actually occur less, and um, even events deemed possible occur only 20% of the time. This is from the study that you see there. Optimism and wishful thinking. Just because you want to buy the for the 15 thinking that is gonna go up to 20 and you wish for it is obviously not gonna happen um, we are very optimistic and there's a fine line between being optimistic and being overconfident um, we are having this fallacy where we always think that we can complete tasks sooner than we actually are that from optimism, from overconfidence, the planning fallacy, and we are also believed that our average, so we're anchoring on ourselves, thinking that we are above average in many domains, including investing. And representativeness, if you recall, um, if we give this example that Linda is 31 years old, single, outspoken, and very bright, she majored in philosophy. As a student, she was deeply concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice, and also participated in anti-nuclear anti demonstration. Pick one before you move to the next slide. Lisa is a band teller, and Lisa is band teller and active in the feminist movement. Which one did you pick? Right. So we are trying to figure out where Lisa is rep representative from. And we talk about conjunction fallacy, where um, it's more likely to be an A than B, right? Confirmation bias. We are reluctant to search for evidence that contradicts our belief. We are rather um, look for evidence that confirm our choice. So if you purchase a stock or that you're much, you're more com uh, convinced that the stock will go up after, after you purchase it than, rather than before. Um, even when, if we find any evidence that is contradicting our assumptions, we treat it as with some kind of skepticism, or it goes, or we trying to mis misinterpret it and um, trying to turn it in our favor. This confirmation bias is very strong. We are not searching for um, evidence to help us, but rather to, uh, to harm us, the, the contradicting one, but rather to help us. And uh, that's why you have to do to apply science in your thinking, uh, hypothesis testing, where you're trying to actually um, confirm the alternative hypothesis. Availability bias, when we try to judge the probability of an event, we often search our memory for relevant information. So whatever we remember quicker, which is usually um, recent or more salient events will give will get, have more weight and um, will obviously distort the estimate how do economists respond to this economists obviously they know what's going on in behavioral finance and they are saying that well that's true but people through repetition will learn their way out of biases and that is true to some extent. System 2 has the capability of training System 1 over time. However, these um, errors are not necessarily easy to, to, to fix. Experts in the field make fewer errors. While that is true in general, we've seen that also experts make, make errors just like anybody else. With more powerful incentive, the effects will disappear. Um, this is very hard to test. The incentives, it depends on the incentive. They could be non-financial or financial. Um, with financial incentives, effects 
might disappear, but that, that doesn't that necessarily they don't turn they don't come back. And so these are some um, arguments that people will learn and they can change, which is they're true, uh, but they you can't say they're totally eliminating these biases. Learning helps, but it's a its effect is diminished by the environment, the application errors. So you can only learn if the environment stays the same. If the environment changes, remember from choice architecture, um, when we talk about choice architecture in the next lecture, you will see that environment has a lot of influence over our decisions. Context has a lot of influence over our decisions. And if we change the context, and the environment, our also decision-making process will have to change. It cannot stay the same because if it stays the same, we introduce biases again. So we understand biases when they're explained to us. In system two, we, we get it. But we immediately proceed to evaluate it again in specific situation or environments because system one doesn't care. System one is a jumping to conclusion kind of system. Experts way too often display more overconfidence than laymen, especially when they receive only limited feedback about their prediction. This is very quite an important um, point is that experts they are they know they're they know they know they know and they 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 display more overconfidence because they don't allow for any kind of doubts or some feedback that will contradict. If I'm an expert, then I know my stuff, I know my field, and uh, I become more confident to the point that where I can slip into overconfidence. While incentives can sometimes reduce the biases in ourselves, no replicated study has made rationality violation disappear purely by raising, raising incentive. The second topic is um, equity premium puzzle. The core of the equity premium puzzle is that even though stocks appear to be an attractive asset, they have high average returns compared to bonds, investors appear very unwilling to hold them. And when they do, they require substantial risk premium in exchange. To date, behavioral finance has um, pursued two approaches to this puzzle. Both are based on preferences. One it relies on prospect theory and the other one on ambiguity aversion. In essence, both approaches try to understand what is that makes the investor fear stocks so much, leading them to charge a higher premium for them. So we're not gonna get into nitty gritty details of this equity premium puzzle. There's a lot of discussion about it and a lot of mathematical formulas behind it, but we will try to bring some of the approaches that we know from prospect theory especially, and uh, to bring it to give some kind of explanation for the equity premium puzzle. So there's an enormous, enormous discrepancy between the returns on stocks and fixed income securities, such as bonds. Since 1926, the annual real return on stocks has been about 7%, while the real return on treasury bills has been less than 1%. So quite a significant discrepancy over such a long period of time, which translates in a lot of wealth being left on the table by the investors who do not participate in the stock market. Obviously, we're looking over very long, very long term and not short term. It makes a difference if we're looking over short term versus long term. So we are trying to add what we know from behavioral economics into this and try to explain this theory. And the first one is that uh, via the prospect theory, when choosing between gambles, where people compute the gains and losses for each one, for each gamble, and select the one with the highest prospective utility. That's how we do when we are faced with gambles. We compute the gains and losses for each one and go with the one that gives us obviously more higher prospect utility. 
that leads to loss aversion. Loss aversion is super strong, very strong in our in our minds, and we are fear that a major drop in our financial wealth is going to occur. And for that reason, we are requiring a higher premium at compensation. Again, if you recall the value curve in the prospect theory paper, the value curve shows that the slope at the origin between gains and losses are very different. The, the slope for losses is much steeper than the slope for gains. Therefore, this creates this loss aversion bias where this fear, because we're fear of a drop, we have to demand higher premium for that. Whereas the bonds or the, the, the bonds are very safe, so it's a gain, and we will take the gain anytime, especially when we don't wanna when we want to avoid the losses. And uh, using the ambiguity paradox, we have evidence that people dislike ambiguity or situations when we are uncertain what the probability is, you know, of a gamble. And this is potentially very relevant for finance as investors are often uncertain about the distribution of a stock's return. So the opposite, a preference for the familiar, we like what we are familiar with, has been observed when we prefer to gamble on something familiar, like the stock of the company where we work for, which is a big mistake from the investing point of view because it's a double whammy. If you lose your job, you also lose the options that you have or the interest. The company might go down in, in price. The stock price might go down because the company is done not doing well, thus you're losing your, your job. So it's a double double whammy here. However, the, we do prefer something familiarity. It's called the home bias. We, are, we like to invest around. The next topic is investor behavior. And uh, behavior finance have, has had some success in explaining how certain group of investors behave. Uh, and in particular, what kind of portfolio they choose to hold and how they trade over time. The goal is simply to explain the action of certain investors and not necessarily to claim that these actions also affect prices like we've done in the previous day. Two factors make this research on investor behavior important. One is the cost of entering the stock market has fallen and more and more investors enter the stock market. So it's important to understand how they behave and how they make decisions around investments. And second, more and more uh, individuals are now uh, responsible for their retirement accounts through the defined contribution retirement saving plans and social security. So it's also important to understand how well they are handling this kind of tasks. Uh, we will describe some of the evidence on the action of investors and the behavioral ideas that have been used to explain it. First, we're going to look at to see what kind of biases lead to insufficient diver diversification. One important is pronounced, it's a, pro it's a pronounced home bias, which means that 94 of the investors in the US invest in domestic equities, 98% of Japanese investor invest in Japan and 82% of the UK investor invest in the UK stock market. So it's hard to explain this on uh, rational grounds because if you're looking for um, high return that you should go to whatever you receive those high returns even if though even if it means going into different markets. So we show that people dislike ambiguity, sit, uh, uh, ambiguous situation where they feel unable to specify a gamble's probability distribution. Often these are situations where they feel that they have little competence in evaluating a certain gamble. So like any investment, it is a gamble. On the other hand, people show excessive liking for familiar situation where they feel they're in better position than others to evaluate a gamble. And these are ambiguity and familiarity offer a simple way to understanding the differences, examples of insufficient diversification. Um, also studies of allocation decisions in 401ks find a strong bias in holding own company stock, much of it representing 
voluntary contribution by employees and we, uh, we, we associate this with familiarity of the company you work for although it's not a rational way to invest, it's not a rational way to distribute, to, to, to diversify. So the future of the future welfare of these households depend on their ability to make sound investment decisions. While it would be convenient if all investors always make personally optimal decisions, they do not. Investors and many others would benefit from education and advice, especially when we are making this kind of mental errors. So when dealing with investing around your house, around your uh, what you're familiar with, around your country, around your company, uncertainty, fears, and familiarity with a known situation make people feel that they're better positioned than others to evaluate a gamble. Familiar assets are attractive and people invest heavily in those and invest little or nothing at all in ambiguous assets, assets that they don't know much about them. Biases that lead to naive diversification. When people do venture in diversification, they do it in naive fashion. More exactly, they pretty much allocate one divided by how many holdings they have to each of the N available investment options, whatever those inv investment options are. So instead of allocating by weights, depending on the returns, they allocate simply by dividing. I have five stocks. I'm going to uh, allocate 20% of my investment portfolio to each. This is the naive diversification. Um, bias the lead to excessive trading. If there should be, there should be not much of a trade, meaning that once you find an investment that you like, that you know is bringing you high returns, you should stick um, with it. So one of the clear, clearest prediction of rational models is that there should be very little trading. If we are in a rational world, I should not buy if you're ready to sell, because when you're selling, that means you're disposing of a stock, you don't like it anymore, and there should be some reason behind it, and that would make me very wary of buying a stock that you want to dispose. However, for some reason, in contrast, the volume of trading on the world stock exchanges is very high. The most prominent bias displayed here is overconfident. As you saw, overconfident it is indeed the mother of all biases appears everywhere. People believe that they have information that is strong enough to justify a trade. I have better information than you, so you must be selling the stock because you don't know as much as I do when I buy, so I buy the stock. And apparently this is always some kind of conflict, but this is how prices are set and free markets would not exist without this kind of transaction where people agree to buy and sell. Right away we can predict that people who are more overconfident we will trade more and because of transaction costs they will earn lower returns. Other biases that lead to wrong selling decisions, the disposition effect. This has to do with the fact that you're selling stocks that have gone up in value rather than stocks that have gone down. So you're much more willing to sell the winners rather than the losers. And you cannot explain this basis on rationality. If, if a stock goes up, you should let it go up. You should collect more revenue, uh, more um, uh, profits off it. However, the way what we see here is that we see a gain. We see a gain in the stock, in, the, in, in a winner that, that went up, in, in, a, in a stock that's gone up. We see that gain, and unless we sell it, we're not going to realize the gain. And what, what do we know about a sure gain? So if I sell it now, I'm going to get a sure gain. We know that we are much more prone of doing that. So, uh, stocks that are going down in value, they are losing value. So you bought it at 10, now it's $5. Dollars. 
you are much more likely to take a gamble. So I'm going to hold on to this stock, even if it's a loser, because I might gamble, it might come back up. If the only rational explanation would be to sell the loser for tax purposes, which kind of makes more sense in our environment. So there are two explanations here. One is the irrational belief of mean reversion, that a loser will eventually come back up. And prospect theory that says the loss aversion is strong and it's much more um, uh, likely that I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with a gamble if the stock is going down and take a gain when the stock is going up. The irrational belief of mean reversion. What, what we also know what goes up must come down, or what might must what goes down must come up. Using prospect theory we are ensuring a gain rather than facing losses. We only get a loss when we, sold, when we sell the stock, otherwise losses on paper, paper don't count. Selling a loser makes us recognize the loss, which according to the prospect theory, hurts a little bit much more than selling the winner. So we don't sell, we don't want to look like we're losers, we don't like losses, we don't sell, we hang on to the losers as we prefer to gamble when we are faced with a loss. Very well. Other biases that lead to the wrong buying decision are the attention effect. Investors are more likely to chase stocks that are going up because the media keeps pounding on those stocks. If the, if the stock is going up, especially in a very um, frenzy environment, the media will report much more on those precisely because they go up. So it, they don't necessarily represent that they're going to go up forever, but because of the um, recency effect and because it's very vivid in your mind, you are more likely to chase stocks that are going up. So when other people buy the stock and Obviously, you read about it in the, in the news, in the comments, and so on. We kind of figure out that because of the social proof, this is the correct behavior, and I should buy the stock as well. Moving on to the common investment mistakes. There are some common investment mistakes and biases that cause them overconfidence, optimism, denying random events and regression to the mean, anchoring, status quo, procrastination, prospect theory, and so on. Overconfidence produces excessive trading. We are generally overconfident about the precision of our knowledge, beliefs, and prediction. We believe that we know more than the other, so we buy a stock that someone else is selling. In investing, this translates to a tendency to be excessively sure that we know where the market is headed or we, that we can pick the right stocks and mutual funds in which to invest. This leads to a more active investing and trading, which due to a cost, transaction cost, will lead to lower returns. How is this bad? Data suggests that the stocks or managed funds underperform the market in every despite our optimism. So optimism alone doesn't necessarily give you higher return. The average investor during the 91, 96 earn a return of 16.4 during a booming market compared to 17.9 for the overall market return. Optimism about investment decision. Optimism is closely related to overconfidence, yet, dis yet distinct from it. There's only a fine line that separates the two. Overconfidence lead to overly confident decision while holding unwarranted optimism about future success. Moreover, they will maintain the optimism even when the evidence of the result are easily available. Uh, so, denying that events, random events are random, the hot hand effect, which people believe that the stock is hot, it will continue to go up. They'll be more willing to chase it and pay the fees to get on the board and do what other people are doing. Um, also, we also look for patterns. So if the returns of this hot stock when were pretty good over the past few days or few weeks or few months, we expect that pattern to repeat in a 
in a show of confirmation bias, we expect that pattern to repeat in the future, and we are kind of forgetting about the role of chance in our decisions. Even momentum stocks, which show some evidence that their performance could continue higher in the next year, will reverse themselves in the subsequent years. Anchoring the status quo and procrastination. Most people, most professors that enroll in the retirement plans offered by Tia Kraft, facing a choice between their investment in retirement funds, bonds or stocks, they allocated half of each um, to the two accounts. In addition, no changes were made to the allocation over their career. This is a naive allocation, a naive investment that never changed, even if the life circumstances have changed over time. So we're anchored 50-50, we place 50% of each um, of our investments, our funds in the two accounts, uh, we don't like changes, the status quo or the default option is to keep them going, no change, and we procrastinate. I'm sure that we mean to uh, change this investment in the future, but we never get a, around to do it. Status quo, the default option, like we said, people tend to keep their investment as they are. Procrastination, we do not to want to take action. We have all the intent, but there's no action, and that is the procrastination part. Prospect theory, selling winners and keeping losers. We are more eager to sell the winners as the performance of this investment improves. Why? Decision making use reference points to compare gains and losses. Usually the price they purchased the stock. So if I bought a stock at 10 and now it's 20, I'm sitting on a sure gain only if I sell the stock. So I'm much more likely Again, system one says this is the easier option, this is the easier solution, let's do it. You sell the winner and you keep the loser because you don't want to, um, you take a gamble when you're faced with losses. And this is evidence that we have that winners are the one that investors end up selling. In conclusion, behavioral finance is a part of behavior economics that deals with investor behavior in the financial market. And as you can see, the same biases that are that we face on a daily basis, no matter which, of which field we're in, they're still the same, they're still strong. Anchoring, overconfidence, the loss aversion there. Everywhere we go, we take them with us, no matter which uh, application might be. So it's it is very important that we understand that behavior economics in general, it, sh it works in any business application. Anywhere we go, we take all these biases with us. And different situations change, and we're, we're facing with the same application of our biases, same results, no matter where we go. So in conclusion, I want you to remember that um, behavior economics is about how people make decisions and that the context, the environment, influence our decision. System one is always ready to jump out with an answer. And if we are, if system two is not there to catch it, if the environment is changed, system two has not learned it yet, then we will go on with the erroneous conclusion. Thank you very much, and thank, uh, I'll see you in the next lecture.